If you do have a Bible with you, please turn with me now to 1 Kings chapter 9. And we're going to read together the first nine verses. So 1 Kings chapter 9. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you. And if you keep my statutes and my judgments. Then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other, other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And as, for, and as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. And may God bless what we've read together uh, just now from his word. If I was to ask you this evening, how can I pray for you? What do you need the most? I wonder what your initial answer would be. I doubt it would be, well, I could do with a million pounds, or I need a new car. We're probably all more spiritually minded than that. Although maybe there might be legitimate reasons to be praying for maybe a new car. But I wonder if your answer would be more faithfulness, a closer walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Would it be something along those lines? Is that the initial thought that jumps into your mind if somebody says, how can I pray for you? The passage before us tonight highlights that particular need. The need for faithfulness. The need in a New Testament context for a closer walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. So my title this evening is The Need for Kingdom Faithfulness. The need for kingdom faithfulness. Following this brief introduction that we have in, in the first two verses of chapter uh, nine, it, what we read splits into basically three points. We have uh, God talking to Solomon about the privileges of being in a relationship with him. We have then God going on and, and giving certain assurances certain promises to Solomon, but then it ends with warnings about unfaithfulness. So before we get to those three things, we need to briefly touch upon, upon this, this introduction. I think there's some interesting things that we can, that we can quickly take away from, from verses one and two. As, as we're introduced uh, to, this, to this chapter, we see at the beginning of verse nine, of chapter nine and verse one, that, that the temple is complete. Solomon's palace is complete. All the 
all the buildings used to govern the nation are complete. But we read that all Solomon's desire, which he had wanted to do, is achieved. Solomon has achieved all his goals. Everything he set out to do is done. You wonder, don't you, about Solomon? Maybe if after he completed all these goals, if he had set himself new goals, if he had set new targets ahead of himself, if he had continued to push forward, maybe he wouldn't have fallen in the ways that he did in later life. There's no resting on our laurels in Christian service. Yes, for us as a church, God has done something amazing in bringing us together as, as, as Ramsey Baptist Church. But we don't now just get to sit back and, and look back on it and think, well, well that's it. We've, we've done it. We've, we've achieved all we set out to do. No, we, we need to press on. We need to think about new goals. What do we as Ramsey Baptist Church need to achieve next in God's service? Because the truth is, if we're not going forwards, we will actually be going backwards. It's just an interesting little point to, to draw out of, of verse one. And then notice also uh, verse two. The Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And I was struck by that as I thought about this passage. We perhaps get, get a little bit used to God appearing to people in the Bible. Uh, he appears either in dreams or in visions or personally uh, through the pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. But actually, this wasn't something that happened every day. Even to the men and women of the Bible. This wasn't something that happened every day. In fact, you can think of some examples, I'm sure, of, of great men and women of faith in Scripture who never had such a, such a meeting. But for Solomon, this is the second time God spoke with him like this. First time was when he became king and, and God... Uh, said to Solomon, ask what you want of me. And Solomon prayed for wisdom. This time, God comes to Solomon when he's resting on his laurels, when he's done all that he wanted to do. And he comes with uh, assurances and promises, but also with warnings. So let's look at those things. Let's, let's move on now. Let's look at the privilege, the assurance, and the warning. And we, and we start then with kingdom privilege, kingdom privilege. Just think of some of the things that we're told here in verse three. First one, God hears our prayers. God hears our prayers. Verse three, and the Lord said to him, to Solomon, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. God hears our prayers. Again, it's perhaps easy to say that, uh, matter of factly, and we should be absolutely amazed by it. God hears our prayers. When we speak to him, he hears and he responds. I don't know if you've ever uh, tried to get through to a, to a call centre and you can spend ages waiting in the queue and then when you actually get through to speak to the person, they don't actually appear to really be listening to what you're saying. They don't take on board whatever the issue or whatever the complaint is that you might have. And it can be frustrating. God isn't anything like that. It's not like we're picking up a phone and trying to get in touch with a call center and trying to get to the right person who will actually help us with the problem that we have. Now, God is the right person and he hears and understands all our prayers. God hears our prayers and God answers 
our prayers. Read on. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. Uh, this is in response to the prayers that we were looking at last time that, that Solomon had prayed in regards to God uh, blessing the temple and blessing and being with his people. Solomon had prayed for God to bless the temple that he had built. And God says, I've done that. I've answered your prayer. I've consecrated the temple. I've put my name on it. I am going to dwell there. God hears our prayers and God answers our prayers. Nothing at all like trying to get in touch with a call center. Even more amazing than knowing that God hears our prayers is knowing this, isn't it? That God answers our prayers. Lord Jesus Christ says to us in Matthew 7, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. What's on your heart tonight to pray for? Whatever it may be, don't hold back. Because God hears and answers prayers. Of course, the answer might not be what we expect. The answer might not be in the timing we would like it to be in. But he hears and he answers prayers. And his answer is always the perfect and best answer at the perfect and best time. One more. God is with his people and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. God promises to be in the temple. He promises to be with his people. Yes, uh, he is dwelling in, in the Holy of Holies. He's shut away from uh, the direct presence of the people. Uh, indeed, only the high priest can go uh, into that place once every year. But God is still there with his people. For us, of course, we know, don't we now, that, that God is with us all day, every day. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ Jesus dwells in you, Christian. I love the closing words of, of Matthew 28, verse 20. Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm always with you. There's nowhere you can go where I won't be with you. There's no moment that you can be in where I won't be with you. I don't take a day off. I'm always with you. It's wonderful. It's so comforting, so reassuring. These are the privileges that we have. God hears our prayers. God answers our prayers. And he is with us always. Solomon and God's people, they enjoyed these massive kingdom privileges. But as we'll come on to see, these kingdom privileges are actually conditional. They're conditional. Look at verse 4. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, God is, is putting conditions on these privileges and these assurances that are, come, that are to come. He says, I'll hear your prayers. I'll answer your prayers. I'll, I'll be with you. But as long as you are faithful and obedient to me. We'll come on to the warnings about what will happen if they weren't in a moment. But first, we just need to look at the, the assurances, the kingdom assurances that God gives to Solomon here. He says, if you follow me as David followed me, verse four, then he will, verse five, establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David, your father saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. So God gives this wonderful assurance to to Solomon, if you're faithful to me, I will establish your throne and your descendants' throne forever. That's the assurance. That's the promise. But as I've said, just to emphasise this point, it, it's conditional. And we should always remember that 
about these, these promises that God makes to the earthly nation of Israel. These promises about an earthly king, about an earthly kingdom. They are always conditional on God's people being faithful, being obedient to God's revealed word, faithful to him and worshipping him alone. That brings me then on to the, to the third point, kingdom warnings. Kingdom warnings. What's going to happen if Israel, if Solomon or his descendants aren't faithful? Well, it's, it's, uh, we can read of it from verse 6. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them. People will go into exile. And this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. I will leave the temple. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all the peoples. And as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished. And they will hiss and say, why has the Lord done this, done thus? to this land and to this house. Then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. And those are not empty threats, are they? The book of, the book of Kings, one and two kings together, they, they chronicle Israel and Judah's a departure from faithful service into idolatry. And they chronicle the failure of the lines of the kings, the captivity of the people, the destruction of the temple. None of that needed to happen if the people, if Solomon, his descendants, the people had, had continued in faithfulness. They would have continued to enjoy those blessings that God promises them, but they didn't. That's why the, the heading for this whole series is about the story of one kings. It's a story of glory to ruin. But what I want to do in the time that remains to me this evening is pull out some, some kingdom lessons and then also look at the kingdom today. Uh, because we can perhaps misapply some of, some of what we've been thinking about if we're not careful. So fourthly, kingdom lessons, kingdom lessons. What's the, what's the big lesson that comes out of this passage, this text for us? Well, it's got to be about obedience. It's about obedience. First of all, we, we see the, the premium God places on obedience or the importance God places on obedience. As Christians, we, we perhaps uh, put premium and importance in, in, in different areas. Some as Christians may think, well, well what matters most is, is what I feel. That's what I need to focus on. I need to focus on, on, my, on my feelings, on, on my emotions. I need to feel God's presence with me. That's what matters. Others? Perhaps this is something that, that we're most uh, likely to go down is we might put the emphasis on, on, what, we, on, what, we, on what we know. We've, we've got our, our theological eyes dotted and, and our T's crossed. And, and we need to know more. We need to know more. Of course, feeling and knowing God's truth, those things do matter. Uh, I've said that so many times. But here God isn't saying if you continue to feel if you continue to grow in knowledge, he's saying if you continue to obey, if you continue to obey, if you remain faithful, verse four, now if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, God puts the premium on obedience. And think about the nature of the obedience that God puts this pre premium on. Who gets to define what it is? Who gets to say what obeying God looks like? Is it up to me as an individual to decide for myself what obeying God is like? 
Is it up to the church or the eldership to decide what obeying God looks like? No. God says here that, that he defines it. It is this integrity of heart and this uprightness that he talks about in verse 4. is to do according to all that I have commanded you, he says. And if you keep my statutes and, and my judgments, God tells us what pleases him. So our worship of God is prescribed for us in Scripture. We don't get to add to that. We don't get to take away from that. We do what God says. How we behave as a husband or a wife, as a parent or a child. God tells us how we should do that. How we behave in the home, in the workplace, in society, in church life. What are our responsibilities to God, to our church, to our families, to our societies, to ourselves? God's word is telling us these things, laying them out in scripture. He tells us how he wants us to obey. These are, these are these kingdom lessons, the emphasis here. But as I said, at the same time, we need to be able to take those lessons out of their old covenant setting. We need to be able to put them in the new covenant reality, the covenant of grace that, that we're under. We, we need to understand them in those terms. So that's really what I want to finish on this evening. I want to touch upon the the kingdom today, the kingdom today. And so I want us to look, first of all, at this uh, conditionality, if you like, that we've, that we've considered uh, this evening. We've seen, haven't we, that what God said to Solomon was incredibly conditional. It was very much, if you're faithful, I will bless you. If you're unfaithful, I will punish you. What does this mean for us in terms of, of the new covenant, in terms of being under the covenant of grace? Well, things, things are different. Things are different for us in that we are not the ones who meet God's covenant conditions. The Lord Jesus Christ does that on our behalf. Let me explain that. These stipulations are actually all still the same. God rewards obedience and he punishes disobedience. But as 2 Corinthians 5.21 reminds us, the Lord Jesus Christ has stepped in and met both sides of that equation. He's met all the conditions on our behalf. He has lived the perfect life. So he's obeyed all the stipulations of obedience that lead to covenant reward. And he has paid the price, taken on the punishment for covenant disobedience. He's done it all. I'll just read that verse to you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he, God the Father, made him who knew no sin, God the Son, that's the perfect obedience, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ has lived a perfect life of obedience on our behalf. He has endured all the punishment for disobedience on our behalf as well. He has met all the conditions of pleasing and satisfying God for us. This is how, how grace is greater than the law. In Solomon's day, the truth is you, you could be under the covenant in one day, under the covenant blessing one day, but the next day you could be under the covenant curse. For us, that isn't the case. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we are eternally under the covenant blessing. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There's no condemnation for us now. Of course, that covenant does stretch back into the Old Testament as well. So these spiritual realities were things those Old Testament believers could experience. But what does this mean in regards to our 
faithfulness. What does this mean in regards to, to our faithfulness? Why do we continue to obey? Why do we continue to do what God wants us to do? If the Lord Jesus Christ has met all the stipulations of the covenant on our behalf, if God views us as righteous because Jesus Christ is righteous, if God views our sin paid for because Jesus Christ died for it on the cross, why do we keep God's law? Well, I touched on this on Sunday evening and I spoke about a portion of God's words from uh, Hebrews chapter 8. I'm just going to pick one of those verses again just to emphasize the point again this evening. Hebrews 8 verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. God's law is, is now internalized in us. What pleases him is uh, encoded on our very being. We have, if you like, been rewired uh, in such a way that, that our lives will be lived in God-pleasing ways. Not perfectly, but that is the, the general nature, the general direction of how we will live. The point here is that, is that grace is bigger than the law. Grace internalizes what pleases God within us so that we don't just do it out of mere duty, out of mere compunction. We do it because we know it pleases the one who has saved us. Grace then is bigger than law, much bigger than law. So actually the truth is our response uh, to, to grace should be far greater than the response to law that you see throughout the Old Testament. It should be our delight. It should be our joy to please our Heavenly Father through the ways that we live because we have the law written on our hearts. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. So in that sense that the need for kingdom faithfulness today is in no way diminished. Our calling is not simply to trust. It is to trust and obey. It is to live out our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ through a life of obedience to all that God requires of us. And that's something that we don't do in our own strength. Not only has the Holy Spirit written the law upon our hearts, He's also the one who gives us the strength and the will to do all that is pleasing to God. Amen.